as you have noticed, I'm the only woman on the panel, and I'm also the only Saudi person on the panel. But let me put the Saudi uh, word in inverted commas, because I need to tell you about a, 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 his, a little history that is very personal. I came to Britain in 1983 as a young student who wanted to pursue her education at the most esteemed universities in Britain. I went to Cambridge, I did my master, and also I did my PhD. As I finished my PhD in social anthropology, looking at the history of Saudi Arabia, I, my father got a phone call from nobody but Prince Salman at the time. He was the governor of Riyadh. And Prince Salman conveyed the information to my father that if I publish my PhD thesis, I will be subjected to disciplinary action, whatever that means. Well, of course, I went ahead and published my dissertation and published another 14, 15 books afterwards. <laughs> I, remained, I remained Saudi, living in Britain, moving to different jobs, becoming a professor at a, a British universities here in London, first at King's College, and then I moved to LSC. But in 2005, I got another phone call from my father, who was informed by the King of Saudi Arabia that my Saudi nationality was withdrawn. So, luckily, I was a British citizen by that stage. Why was it withdrawn? Because I went on television to, to object to the fact that Saudi women were deprived of participating as voters and candidates in the municipal elections. We're not talking here about national elections, a parliament, God forbid, because in the Saudi Islamic tradition, our constitution is the Quran, and there is no need for elected parliaments because the king knows it all, and he can decide for everybody. So I lost my Saudi passport, but my story is not unique. You probably have heard in the last two weeks the story about Rahaf al qunun who escaped from Saudi Arabia, ended up in Thailand, and then Canada luckily accepted her as an asylum seeker. According to the United Nations, UNHCR, there are now two, over 2,000 Saudi asylum seekers going to the United States, to Canada, and Britain. So this wealthy country where we are told that British expats love to go and work un there and earn untaxed salaries, are, uh, uh, want to go to that country, we find that the Saudi men and women are leaving the country. So if you're worried about migration and asylum seekers, we are heading towards a crisis in Saudi Arabia. Today, Saudi Arabia is a pressure cooker on the verge of implosion, simply because the so-called reforms of the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is hailed by the international media from the New York Times to the Washington Post to our press here in Britain, is the great revolutionary reformer. He allows Saudis to go to concerts and he allows women to attend football matches if accompanied by their male guardians. So this top-down revolution that is happening is producing asylum seekers, is producing the people, the real people, who have been mentioned by my colleague Mehdi Hassan. So from women activists, from uh, the people who are simply tweeting, people who are at university, my colleague Hatoun El Fasi, she studied in Manchester University. She is an archeologist specializing in deciphering the inscription of the Nabataean civilization in the north of Saudi Arabia. That Mohammed bin Salman wants to become a tourist attraction uh, 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 encouraging you, the educated audience, to go and see this archaeological site. She specializes in deciphering the inscriptions of this ancient civilization. She is now in prison and has been since June 2018. Her crime, nobody knows. 
According to the Saudi press, we have uh, the front pages of the uh, Saudi-owned newspapers talking about these women activists who had been put in jail as traitors, as agents of foreign governments. I myself are, is uh, called also a traitor, an agent of the British intelligence services, simply because I write books, enjoy the freedom of speech that this country allows me and my own country deprives me of. So, if we're talking, I do agree with my colleague uh, Mamoun when we say the West. I don't like these generalizations. In as much as I don't like the idea that there is a Muslim world out there or an Arab world. No, we're talking about individual countries. In Britain, for example, we are always told that we can't shun those people who torture their own citizens, who bomb other countries. We have to have constructive engagement with them, a dialogue with them. My colleague here, the right honorable gentleman, uh, Crispin, asked the Saudi embassy to allow him to go to Saudi Arabia or allow a team to investigate the alleged torture of women activists. And what did the Saudi embassy do? Didn't reply, I understand. Um, <laughs> so the constructive engagement is supposed to, in the British government's rhetoric, successive government, is meant to do behind the door diplomacy. Um, be, you know, talk about the British citizens who are tortured in Saudi prisons. We won't talk about them publicly, but we will put pressure on the Saudi government to change its behavior. So far, I do not see any change of behavior. Women activists are put in prison, uh, tortured also, um, and uh, I cannot see that this situation has changed. So the domestic situation is really bad. But we can't express or expect different Western government to cut ties with Saudi Arabia. By cutting ties, I mean the different Western governments should suspend their unconditional support for the Saudi regime and underline the word unconditional support. So when MBS orders the killing of a journalist, he, until now, we don't give him an ultimatum, whereas we give the Venezuelan president an ultimatum to have elections. <laughs> and we don't regard that as interfering in the sovereignty of the Venezuelan people. But when it comes to Saudi Arabia, oh, no, no, we can't interfere because those people are ruled by Sharia, some kind of Islamic law, that they are not like us. We exoticize them. We make Saudis look as if they are extraterrestrial, that they are governed by a law that is not shared by humanity. When the Saudi regime abuses its own people, it's violating international values and norms, and we have to be responsible for that. At the international uh, level, how do we boycott a country? How do we put pressure on a country? Well, my friend gave the example of Cuba, but remember that Britain, the US, are the main suppliers of the weapons that Saudi Arabia uses to destabilize the region rather than create stability. In Lebanon, they force the prime minister to resign to precipitate a crisis. In Bahrain, they intervene to derail the democracy impulse in 2011. And in Qatar, they fractured the solidarity of Gulf countries. In Yemen, I don't need to tell you about Yemen, the poorest country of the Arab world. So, ladies and gentlemen, you are an educated audience. Your vote is extremely important because you're sending a message to our government here in Britain and around the world, as this debate will be seen by so many people outside this country. You are sending a debate rejecting this unconditional support, the carte blanche that the Saudi regime gets from different Western countries. Thank you very much.
Thank you to Madawi Al Rashid. Last but not least, our last speaker against the motion, Crispin Blunt, regarded as one of the most experienced foreign policy voices in the UK Parliament. Of course, you may say, how many foreign policy voices are there in the UK Parliament? It's a voice that's often heard on Saudi Arabia. As Madawi Al Rashid mentioned, he was part of an MP's panel that went to Saudi Arabia to consider the jail conditions for Saudi women activists. It was published today and concluded that their jail conditions could be akin to torture. He's the Conservative MP for Rygate Chair, and he was Chair of the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Select Committee from 2015 to 2017. Welcome to Crispin Blunt, against the motion. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Many thanks to Intelligence Squared for organizing this debate and inviting me to speak on the side of the, uh, of the, of the opposition. Uh, nothing bumpy about this particular track I'm batting on. Um, but many thanks to the previous speakers who have illustrated many of the issues at stake here. And during my 21 years as a Conservative Member of Parliament, I have consistently defended the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's important relationship with the United Kingdom. And I have supported continuing UK arms exports to the Saudi-led coalition operating with unanimous international endorsement uh, in the Yemen. And indeed, as has been pointed out, I did welcome the visit of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to the UK last year. And I suspect many of you, without knowing who I am, seeing that a Conservative Member of Parliament was arguing against this motion, might have been unsurprised, unchallenged by your expectations. However, I hope you are ready to hear a more nuanced point of view and that I can challenge your expectations. Now, I first met Mohammed bin Salman when leading the Commons Foreign Affairs Committee on a visit to Riyadh in December 2015. And over a meeting lasting an hour and a half, I confess I was impressed by his strategic grasp and his ability to engage on all questions on, uh, on all fronts. I've also made countless diplomatic and parliamentary visits to the region since 1993, when I became the Foreign Secretary's then Special Advisor. So I hope I have a decent understanding of the realities of the region, at least by parliamentary standards. Um, therefore, it is I who perhaps am most disappointed with the current state of the kingdom. And I have acute anxieties for its future and the implications that has for the region. And to that end, I hope you will have the chance to glance at this report that I and two parliamentary colleagues Leila Moran and Dr. Paul Williams have published today. It was a detention review panel examining the conditions of eight female detainees and four of their male supporters. And indeed, the name that uh, Mehdi gave first in his speech is the first listed here, whose case uh, we uh, reviewed. And I accepted the task of reviewing the detention conditions of these women's rights activists and their male supporters partly because I hoped I would command the confidence of both Saudi Arabia and its critics for actually being fair. I'm the man who chaired a Foreign Affairs Committee report on Brexit three times, three different reports, and brought them all home unanimously despite a committee split down the middle. And I hoped that my engagement with the Gulf monarchies and public appreciation for the stability those rulers have brought to the Gulf Cooperation Council would lead to cooperation from the kingdom, emphasizing the panel's honest and independent nature. However, as I've already made clear, I'm incredibly disappointed by the series of events that lie behind tonight's debate. And the murder of Jamal Khashoggi provides the most gruesome backdrop. And Lees uh, made clear that our report concluded that the detainees have been subjected to cruel and inhumane treatment, including sleep deprivation, assault threats to life, and solitary confinement. And their treatment is likely to amount to torture and if they are not provided with urgent access to medical assistance, they are at risk of developing long-term health conditions. Torture is a crime of universal jurisdiction, and no nation that can claim to be a liberal democracy can, in all conscience, allow such heinous crimes to go unanswered. So, of course, we must evaluate our ties with Saudi Arabia. We must show the benefits of openness on society. We have a duty to help 
Britain has levers of influence in the kingdom, and we should be intent on pulling them to influence where we can. Indeed, I believe we have a moral responsibility to do so. The picture in Saudi Arabia is as complex as the personality of its young crown prince. The moves of Mohammed bin Salman towards economic reform with Vision 2030 have been accompanied by wider social reform. The removal of arrest powers from the religious police. They have actually prepared the legislation for the easing of male guardianship laws, although it remains to be implemented. And the granting of women's right to drive and the opening of public places of entertainment stands as an incongruous contradiction when you lock up the individuals who were calling for these things in the first place. And I want to state very plainly that the attitude and the actions of the kingdom cannot be tolerated. And it has to be seen how our government in 2019 will recast its relations with Saudi Arabia, not only in the light of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, but with the active suppression of civil society that should accompany any claims of a monarchy that wishes to be at least overtly consultative. But we must address the motion itself. I agree um, with the analysis about the term of the West and how difficult that is, so I'm going to focus principally on the United Kingdom. But cutting ties, which I interpret as cutting all ties, otherwise this debate is simply about semantics, is a rare step in a diplomatic arsenal. Indeed, a full, unambiguous severing of ties is not a simple action. We reserve such decisions for countries we are at war with or who seek to subvert our institutions. The United Kingdom expelled 23 Russian diplomats in the wake of Russia's proved involvement in the attempted murder of the Skripals and the death of Dawn Sturges, sending a strong diplomatic signal that Russia is a bad faith intellectual actor. And I am under no illusions that the status quo with Saudi Arabia is acceptable. However, cutting all ties would amount to both self-harm and harm to the cause of reform in Saudi Arabia, but cutting some ties in certain areas may and indeed should be carried out. But defense, our principal relationship, illustrates the dilemma. I've historically defended British arms sales to the kingdom. And although a re-evaluation of our defense relationship must be on the table, Severing this link would probably be highly detrimental to global security in the long term, whilst obviously painful for our economy and defense industry. But more importantly, we live in a loose, liberal, democratic, rules-based world order, underpinned by NATO, the US security um umbrella, and of course, the United Nations. And this has not always been the case. And indeed, it may be in reverse. Indeed, as a liberal democracy, we should do all in our power to prevent more authoritarian countries who place less value on the rule of law from becoming the dominant paradigm of the world. Cutting totally defense ties with Saudi Arabia would be a gift to increasing the values of China and Russia on the world stage. Right now, we have been able to improve their conduct of the Yemen operation and help them bring uh, the Houthis and themselves and their allies to the peace table. One of the ironies of the relative ineffectiveness of the Saudi military efforts that have seen thousands die is that millions are now at the risk of starvation. And I don't think that's anything many of this in this room would wish for. A full disengagement with Saudi Arabia's armed forces will remove whatever British oversight exists. And do you really want to drive Saudi Arabia towards the re-education camps of Jiangjing, of Russian conduct in Chechnya and Syria, and that these countries who place such wretchedly low value on human rights, the integrity of the individual and the rule of law. But let me illustrate with another dilemma over justice. I was dismayed when in 2015, Britain canceled the contract for the Ministry of Justice to provide training for prison staff in Saudi Arabia which had the admirable goal of providing advice on the improvement of its detention system. And I still maintain that that cancellation was populist nonsense. And whilst it may have been popular, it achieved nothing but a sense of moral satisfaction for the United Kingdom. We were able to assure ourselves that we had no part to play in a justice system which executes for offenses that might not even be crimes in the United Kingdom. But we gave up on the chance to improve the Saudi prison system. And people don't respond well when they're scorned for doing 
something wrong. No one likes to be told on a bad day, even me, that they're wrong. It's much better to offer a solution, to engage and to explain to the other side why an alternative might be better. Megaphone diplomacy and the noisy condemnations will always be heard, humiliating the, deci the decision makers. Of course, public shaming and isolation of offending regimes has a place and can be a spur to progress. But in our instance, thumbing our noses at Saudi prisons merely hardened their attitudes and leading to the current wretched state of detention, which was one of the reasons I was happy to chair uh, this panel. Now, Saudi Arabia has acknowledged once upon a time under King Abdullah, who said that reason rules the world, ethics rules the world, and these can rule the world. This can and should be the case. But we need to drag Mohammed bin Salman along these lines with whatever parts of pressure we can adopt. Otherwise, uh, we have the prospect of an absolute monarchy, ruled, ruling terror, totally closing down the, the space for civil society in Saudi Arabia. And in the end, there will be revolution. And what will follow will be infinitely worse than what they have now.